I'm Ruth Hoberman, and this is an installment of the Close Reading Podcast. I'm going to be talking about stream of consciousness, which is a term that's often used to talk about the way in which modernist novels get inside the consciousness of characters' heads. The term comes from the work of William James, who was a philosopher in the late 19th century and also the brother of novelist Henry James. In his 1890 book, Principles of Psychology, he uses the term stream of thought arguing that thinking does not happen in terms of separate ideas, but in fact there's a mingling of ideas that is often uh, stopped and started by things in our environment or by thoughts uh, that we arrive at and then stop thinking about them. May Sinclair was a novelist herself and read a lot of psychology, and she took the term from William James when she reviewed a novel in 1915 by Dorothy Richardson. The novel was called Pointed Roofs, and it's the first volume of a multi-volume book called Pilgrimage that follows a young girl, Miriam Henderson, through her maturation. And Richardson was really the first to spend that many volumes uh, chronicling the thoughts passing through a single character's mind. Sinclair, in her review, used the term stream of consciousness. And I'm going to read the opening passage, or one of the opening passages, of Pointed Roofs. The organ was playing the Wearin' of the Green. It had begun that tune during the last term at school in the summer. It made her think of rounders in the hot school garden, singing classes in the large green room, all the class shouting gather roses while ye may, hot afternoons in the shady north room, the sound of turning pages, the hum of the garden beyond the sun blinds, meetings in the sixth form study, Lilla with her black hair, and the specks of bright amber in the brown of her eyes talking about free will. You can hear that the passage is in the third person. It made her think, but it is very much a flow of thought going through Miriam's mind. The street organ player outside her window triggers a chain of associations that have no particular logic to them other than the fact that they all happened to Miriam in the past in the presence of that street organ sound. Nothing happens, Sinclair writes. It's just life going on and on. It is Miriam Henderson's stream of consciousness going on and on. Now, stream of consciousness is a kind of broad descriptive term, um, and sometimes it's more useful to think in terms of more specific techniques, one of which is the interior monologue. When the stream of consciousness is particularly extended and alogical, we often call that an interior monologue. And this can be direct when we're in the first person and have no narrator intervening between us and the character's consciousness. The most famo famous example of this comes from James Joyce's 1922 Ulysses, which ends with Molly Bloom in bed at the end of the novel and a lot of thoughts going through her head as she's half asleep. And how he kissed me under the Moorish wall, and I thought, well, as well him as another. And then I asked him with my eyes to ask again, yes. And then he asked me, would I say yes, to say yes, my mountain flower. And first I put my arms around him, yes, and drew him down to me so he could feel my breasts all perfume, yes. And his heart was going like mad, and yes, I said, yes, I will, yes. Here we have first person, and obviously no narrator making sense of what Molly is thinking. There are no sentences, there's no punctuation. It's a jumble of memories, as Molly remembers being courted by her husband, Leopold. And you can also sense that at this point in the novel, Molly is half asleep, she's lying in bed, she's had sex that afternoon with a lover, and she's beginning to menstruate. And so all of these bodily experiences are shaping her thoughts as she remembers back 20 or 30 years. Indirect interior monologue does involve a narrative presence, and Virginia Woolf often uses that technique. She actually writes about narrative method in a 1919 essay called Modern Novels, and there, talking about James Joyce, she says, let us record the atoms as they fall upon the mind, in the order in which they fall. Let us trace the pattern, however disconnected or incoherent in appearance, which each sight or incident scores upon the consciousness. Now, in describing Joyce, she was also describing her own method, which she used in 1925 in which she describes the atoms as they fall upon the mind of various characters, but mainly Clarissa Dalloway. At the beginning of that novel, Clarissa steps outside her front door and, and thinks, what a lark, what a plunge. 
For so it had always seemed to her when, with a little squeak of the hinges, which she could hear now, she had burst open the French windows and plunged at Borton into the open air. How fresh, how calm, stiller than this, of course, the air was in the early morning, like the flap of a wave, the kiss of a wave. She's been thinking about the fact that the doors will have to be taken off their hinges in order to make space for the party that she's giving that night. And just that thought of hinges makes her think about the sound of the hinges and sends her mind back to her young adulthood when she was at Borton where she grew up in the country. And that sets off a chain of associations in her mind. Wolf talked in another essay in 1925 about life as a semi-transparent envelope, a luminous halo. And what she was getting at, I think, explains why she used stream of consciousness in her novels. To get at the core of human experience, she felt you have to get inside people's minds and at the complexity of what it feels like to be a human being from day to day, having all of our sense impressions mingled with memories and perceptions and emotional states. And she felt it was the job of the novelist to get it, all that experience in all its complexity.